start of my first lecture, I asked you to pray. I believe you have. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Because this, these days have been a common experience of God as a result of the fact, I believe, that all of us have been involved in it. But I want to say, because I began by telling you that 40 years ago I was married, what I didn't tell you was the girl I married prayed before she got married. That if the Lord allowed her to find a man who loved his word, that he would help her never to hinder his ministry. I don't know that I fulfilled the precondition, but she has fulfilled her role spectacularly, which leaves me speechlessly thankful to her. Now, in this conference, many of you have come to me and said, what exactly is it you're doing in these talks? <laughs> well, it's a very good question. And I want to take a couple of minutes trying to explain to you what I think I'm doing. <laughs> First of all, I'm doing what I was taught to do by my friend and teacher, David Gooding, who has taught me virtually everything I know, the mistakes I reserve responsibility for. But secondly, when I was a student at Cambridge, I noticed very frequently that there appeared to be a distance between the Bible and reality. First of all, at the level of what I call a technical belief in inspiration. My friends believed that Ezekiel was inspired, but if I asked them what was in it, they had no idea. Do you? It's very easy to talk about the Bible. And the evidences for its authenticity, its reliability, and they are all immensely important. But sooner or later, we've got to get to the Bible. Because in the end, if its authority simply rests on what we say about it, it will never ultimately convince us that it is the Word of God and is authoritative and powerful. And then I noticed why that came about in part. That very frequently, people analyzed the culture and came up with a problem, looked at the Bible to see what Scripture said about it, resolved the problem, and then went back to the next problem. So that their knowledge of Scripture was a collection of problem-orientated solutions. And then I noticed the Bible was not written like that. It was written in books. And what David Gooding showed me, that it's possible to go the other way. That is to start with Scripture and allow it itself to cut like a plow or illuminate like a searchlight the culture and follow it that way round. Now, I am a scientist, and the essence of science is the capacity to systematize. And it has been supremely successful. Indeed, it's a very good thing because God started it in Genesis by inviting human beings to start biological taxonomy in naming the animal. And of course, every scientific discipline is taxonomic in its form. 
It labels things, it systematizes things. But I noticed as I grew up in science that there was a danger. Through our systematizations, we created paradigms of immense sophistication and power. And sometimes those paradigms had a negative effect as well as a positive effect. Their positive effect was to stabilize and conserve knowledge to save us reinventing the wheel, and also to correct us if we were in danger of becoming anti-intellectual mavericks. So the body of knowledge, which consists of our reflection on an external nature, is extremely important. But the danger is that paradigms can take on a life of their own and they can end up defining the reality that we are studying. So that the scientific paradigm becomes all important and nature has to be squeezed to fit the paradigm. And that is part of the reason I am involved in the battle with the new atheism. Because the scientific paradigm is being abused to squeeze reality into a materialistically defined box. Then I noticed there was a parallel danger in theology. I speak not as a theologian, you've already seen that, ladies and gentlemen, but I do try to think about these things. And I'm grateful to the theologians who have over the centuries systemized bodies of theological knowledge but I noticed the same danger. There was a time when J-E-D-P-X-Y-Z <laughs> determined everything. And because he based his thinking on false science, Boltman and others squeezed theology into a paradigm which became all determinative so that scripture had to fit the paradigm. In other words, the objective reality of scripture was being subjectively squeezed into a materialistic box. And of course, theology is sophisticated because God is complex. And there is a danger, isn't there? That theological paradigms take on a life of their own and end up by defining biblical reality. Science, as has been cleverly observed, but many people don't see it, didn't put the universe there. You've noticed that, haven't you? Please notice theology didn't put the Bible there. The Bible is the basis. And because of that danger, it seems to me that just as in science, there is legitimation for a reverse process. That is for allowing the Bible to define reality. Whatever the given dominant theological paradigm has to say. Because just as in science, the paradigms <coughs> can be wrong. They are not infallible. Dare I suggest the same is true in theology? The paradigms are not necessarily infallible. Scripture, I believe, is. And what David Gooding taught me, without any disrespect to the theological paradigms, they are immensely important as our scientific ones to allow Scripture to speak and define reality. And to allow Scripture to speak, we need to look at it as it was written in books. And as I was a student, I discovered another odd phenomenon. And that was that most people, or many, sorry, treated the Bible as less than a book and applied criteria of understanding that they would never have dreamed of applying when getting to grips with any other sort of literature. That I found very strange. And I'm just thankful to God that being a, 
cut off in the scientific enclave or ghetto, God allowed me to be privately educated by an expert in the humanities who taught me about literature. So that really is all I'm trying to do. It's to allow the Bible to speak rather than talk about it. Now, of course, one fails to do that. But it's a deliberate attempt to get the interpreter and the paradigm into the background, let the Bible speak and shape our response to it. So that in the end, and it is my deep conviction, I believe that Scripture is the Word of God, not because of what people have said about it, however important that is, because God has spoken to me through it. And one of the saddest tragedies, and it happens with us all, we spend our life preparing sermons instead of seeking God. And instead of waiting on God until His Word speaks and we hear that authoritative voice, we are content with the sermon for next Sunday. That is the way to spiritual impoverishment, ladies and gentlemen. And we're all guilty of it, myself included. How easy it is to say, I've got to get this sermon done. We need to learn, if ever we're going to affect this world, to learn to take the Bible equally seriously as we do everything else. And there's the next danger. I used to be puzzled. Why was it I found mathematics, philosophy, more interesting than Scripture? It was because I had not taken the latter seriously as, as worthy of intellectual investigation. There is no subject of apologetics in Scripture, is there? There's no such thing as an apologist. And we're in danger of making apologetics a subdivision of philosophy 101. There is apologia, and that is defending the gospel. And as Peter May has brilliantly put it, apologetics is simply persuasive evangelism. You cannot open your mouth about the gospel in any century without having to defend it. But we've but cluttered up by a false dichotomy because we failed to see the difference between trusting reason and using it. Paul used his reason. He never trusted it. And the danger with many of us intellectually, which puts some people off apologetic, is that we trust our reason and use God when we get into difficulty instead of using uh, trusting God and using every gift he's given to us. So these are some of the principles on which I operate, however imperfectly. But now we get back to our final story of Joseph, which is, of course, Jacob's story. You've noticed that their deaths both occur at the end of the book. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. I want to read in chapter 42. And verse 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed 
of them. Joseph has reached one of the highest positions of power ever granted to a believer in God. He's second in command of a world empire. He is the wunderkind of economic strategy. He has saved a vast empire from starvation. And the pressure of that famine has led to the surrounding nations becoming impoverished in terms of food. And they start to come down to Egypt to get supplies. And Joseph, being the hands-on administrator that he was, sees one day vaguely familiar form standing in front of him. And he recognizes, with a thrilling sensation I can imagine tingling down the back of his spine, they're my brothers. Now what's he going to do? So he watches the ten men come in front of him, and the sheaves bow. Just imagine standing there and watching that. He holds the power of life and death. These men betrayed him. They sold him. They'd been the cause of years of solitude, of slavery of false accusation for rape. And without knowing it, they stand in front of a man who could have snuffed out their lives like so many flies by the nod of his head. Your spies, he said. What's he going to do with all his power and these men in it. To be accused of espionage is perhaps something very few of us are familiar. It is a very serious charge. And in the days when I traveled in Eastern Europe and was monitored by the KGB and other people, I was very aware of this kind of thing. To be charged with espionage in the ancient world, it would have terrified these men because they could see a long prison stretch heading before them. Who were they? They were non-entities from a tiny peripheral country and they were standing in the heart of the vast empire. So the first thing Joseph did was to terrify them And they said to him, No, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. And that is going to be the pivot on which the story revolves. He said, No, 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 you're not. And then he sa they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father. And Joseph listening realizes two things in a split second. One, dad's still alive, and my brother Ben's still alive. You imagine learning that? And there he stands with all his power. What's he going to do with the knowledge? And one is no more who's standing in front of them. Your spies are going to test you. By the life of Pharaoh, you'll not go from here unless your youngest brother comes here. 
How Joseph managed to think of this idea so rapidly, I have no notion. But as we'll see, it was genius beyond. Because the whole question now is going to be, has anything happened to these men? They've rejected Joseph. The nearest to Joseph that remains in the family is Benjamin. So the central focus will be, what is their attitude to Benjamin? Has anything changed? I'm going to test you, he said. The word of the Lord had tested him. And now he is going to test them. Send one of you to get him. The rest of you will kept in prison so that your words will be tested to see if you are telling the truth. That's the issue. The word of God in creation. The word of God in defining morality. The word of God in giving the promise. The word of God to be relied upon. But the words of men. Are you a genuine man? What about your words? We're going to test your words. To see if they're true. And the grand vizier of Egypt is interested in words and truth. There's a lot at stake, isn't there? Are we honest men and women? God is interested in truth in the inward parts. He's concerned with moral integrity. And what we're about to see is a detailed analysis of the kind we don't get in the New Testament, which is why we get it in the Old, of how these kind of things are dealt with. So he puts them in custody for three days, and they get a little taste of prison. That's what they'd done to him. Oh, you say, how petty. How spiteful. Really? Or is there something much deeper? Let's see what happened. Third day, Joseph said, do this and you will live because I fear God. I wonder what they thought he meant by that. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers stay in prison. So he's now reduced the punishment. And the rest of you go. And under that pressure, they start to think. And they say to one another, verse 21, In truth we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we didn't listen. This is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben said, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you didn't listen, and now there's a reckoning for his blood. And they didn't know that Joseph understood them because he was speaking through an Egyptian interpreter. And now Joseph knows a great deal more. He knows that Reuben tried to save him. And he knows that their conscience is working. And here he is with all this power. And he moves back and he starts to weep. Oh, please see that it is to trivialize the story, to think that Joseph is wreaking petty vengeance. Here is a study in the sensitivity of power that's capable of weeping. There's nothing like it in any literature that I know of. And what we're about to see is the way a throne can weep. He longed to throw his arms around them. But he couldn't. Why not? 
because Joseph knew that genuine forgiveness and reconciliation cannot occur without repentance. Now, this is a very big topic. I'm going to address it briefly. It seems to me this is firstly a vastly important topic in our world that is rapidly, pragmatically coming to views of reconciliation without justice. And I do not stop to analyze that, but it is vastly important that you experts in law do. It was C.S. Lewis who said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have something to forgive. So please be patient with me. Consider this from a British newspaper. The Reverend Julie Nicholson found it impossible to forgive the men who murdered her 24-year-old daughter, Jenny, who died in a terrorist suicide bomb attack on the London Underground. It's very difficult, she said, to celebrate communion and lead people in words of peace, reconciliation, forgiveness, when you feel very far from that yourself. I do not forgive them for what they did, and I do not think they should be forgiven. And she decided to resign as a minister. The paper then asked, what should she have done? Should she have acted like that wonderful man, Gordon Wilson, in Northern Ireland? who said, and it flashed around the world, that he forgave the terrorists who murdered his daughter in the Oma bombing. Let's think about it for a moment. Forgiveness lies at the heart of the gospel. And the gospel's very basic terms are clear. The Lord in Luke 24 says that, that repentance and forgiveness are to be preached to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Repent and be baptized, says Paul, says Peter, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent then, he says later, and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out. And Paul says to Agrippa, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. So it is clear that the basis of forgiveness is repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus. And our Lord was very straight. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And those instructions are reflected in what the Lord and his apostles say to the disciples. Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as Christ as in Christ God forgave you. And in Luke 17, the Lord says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Now, those statements raise questions in people's hearts. How do you square that with the famous prayer of our Lord, Father, forgive them? for they do not know what they're doing. Let me tell you what I think for you to discuss. I don't want to be dogmatic here, but I notice that the word translated forgive in the Gospels has a range of meanings. Let go, leave, tolerate, permit, send away, release, cancel, pardon, forgive. And this is reflected in the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of forgiveness. One, to give up, to cease to harbor resentment, a disposition or willingness to forgive. Two, to remit or let go a debt to pardon an offender. So it would appear that forgiveness has two dimensions. Firstly, to do with the inner life of the injured party. The need to inwardly let go. And then, the relationship with the injured party. The offender being explicitly pardoned. Both aspects are in Scripture. Mark 11, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him 
Well, it's perfectly obvious that in most cases the offended person will not be present. There is a danger, isn't there? And this is a delicate question, isn't it? Of our lives being damaged by harboring resentment. But when I think of my grandchildren, if any man abused one of them, please think it might be difficult for me to get to that point with all the grace that God could possibly give me. My heart goes out to that minister. It isn't yours. It's very difficult for some of us sitting here whose lives have been psychologically damaged by malicious parental abuse. And we find it difficult to make normal relationships, and it's not our fault. It's very difficult to let it go inwardly, to say nothing of dealing with it outwardly. I find it difficult to say these words, you know, because I feel so unschooled and inexperienced. But I've sat with many people, and when I listen to them, it changes your mind about a lot of things. And Peter, who suffered more than most, told us things that are very difficult to follow. He said, when the Lord Jesus suffered, he didn't threaten. He controlled his tongue. But Peter does not tell us the Lord did not believe in eventual judgment. Because he says in the same breath that the Lord committed himself to him that judges righteously. There will be a judgment, ladies and gentlemen. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So it would be better if you don't do it. The murderers of those two people that now were mentioned in the article in the newspaper are not going to get away with it forever. God will deal with it. But the enormous struggle for the victims is how do I stop this ruining my life? Now let's come to the outward thing. To say to the offender now, I forgive you, is a very different matter. If I've been wounded and I'm the one who has to do the forgiving, I will have to work very hard to get my heart right before the Lord and let it go inwardly. But that is by far not the same thing as an act of pardon or remission or the reestablishment of a relationship because at that level of forgiveness, repentance is absolutely essential. Because God himself doesn't let it go without people repenting. Otherwise, everybody is going to be saved in the end, aren't they? To just say a trivial thing. And there is such confusion. When a microphone is shoved before a a shaking woman whose life has been torn apart. You Christian, you better forgive them, hadn't you? Nonsense. To tell someone their sin is forgiven without them repenting is to say it doesn't matter. It's to condone it. And God will never, never devalue you, as an abused person, by saying it doesn't matter. Never. We need to get this straight, folks. I don't know whether I've got it straight, but I see immense heartbreak because of the failure to distinguish the two things. God will never say it doesn't matter. And to expect a mother who's a terrorist, who's given no shred of evidence, of repentance, I forgive you, is morally absurd. Oh, but didn't Jesus say, Father, forgive them? Of course he did. To whom? 
Look at exactly what our Lord said. Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. To take those words and to apply them in situations where people know exactly what they're doing is, of course, a fundamental error of judgment. Those soldiers were doing as far as they understood their duty. And they heard the Lord pray this prayer. They didn't understand it at the beginning, but if they woke up, as some of them may well have done, to what they'd done, they would have been so overwhelmed by it to have been able to remember those words that the Lord understood and was prepared to accept them would have been enormously powerful. I don't see that it makes any moral sense to take that and apply it to situations where people know exactly what they're doing. The Lord Jesus' behavior is interesting. He didn't pray that prayer. For the Pharisees who openly observed his deeds of miraculous mercy through the power of the Holy Spirit and then deliberately attributed them to the devil. He told them straight, for them there could be no forgiveness either in this world or the world to come. It is a tragic fact, isn't it? That a low Christ has died for all and forgiveness is open to all who will repent and trust God. There are people who will find themselves eternally separate from God because they are not prepared to repent. And none of this means that forgiveness even of a repentant person is easy. Corrie Ten Boom, who was giving her talk and watched, and to her horror saw that one of the SS guards that abused her was sitting in the audience, and he comes up afterwards, repenting, and holds out his hand, will you forgive me? What a wonderful story that is, as she talks about her inner wrestling and finally reaches out her hand. It's magnificent, isn't it? So the two things are difficult. And if we confuse them, we'll only give rise to more pain, I fear. Talking about it's difficult because some of us, all of us, find repentance difficult, especially men, if I might say so. Let's be honest, men. I have no right to talk to the women. When was the last time you repented in front of your wife? Well, you've never done anything recently, have you? <laughs> the scripture says that the two things we need daily are, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Have you noticed you miss it if you don't eat your daily bread? Some of us don't miss it if we've had nothing to do with forgiveness for the last while even more difficult sometimes. Do you find it easy to repent to your children? When you overreact, come home tired and snap. This business is deep, isn't it? And Joseph knew that there would be no real reconciliation unless these men were brought to honest repentance. And to bring them to repentance, it took a famine. It took his rise to power. It took, in a sense, both nature and skillful, under God, handling of the situation to move the foundations of these men to bring them to repentance. to get me to repent. It took God to become human and die on a cross. How is Joseph going to do it? So, he sends them away. They stop for the night. They notice the silver was in their sacks and their hearts sank and they come to their father and tell him that the man demanded Benjamin be brought down. But Jacob won't allow it. He says, you've deprived me of 
my children, he was beginning to guess. And Reuben makes a daft suggestion. He says, look, you can put both of my sons to death if I don't bring him back. Oh, what a silly suggestion. He's lost Joseph. They've lost Simeon. And now what Reuben is suggesting, well, you lose two grandchildren if I fail to bring him back and you've lost him and me and everybody else. Poor old Reuben dealing with his conscience. But the famine got worse. And they approach Jacob again. And he sends them down and Judah says, Judah, send the boy with me and we'll go. I myself shall guarantee his safety. Something moving in the man's heart, isn't there? God is beginning to work. Because now that Joseph is gone, the central issue is, what is Judah's attitude towards Benjamin? Dad, let him go with me. If I don't bring him back and set him before you, I'll bear the blame for all my life. And Judah takes a big step towards repentance. So Jacob said, well, if you're going to do this, let's collect a few things, some honey, some spices, some nuts and almonds. Goodness me. Typical Jacob, but that's another story. Imagine trying to influence a man who was ruling Egypt with a few nuts. <laughs> I'm tempted to say the man was nuts, but then you all wouldn't understand that. And take your money back. So now they get to Egypt. And Joseph sees his brother. Take these men, they're going to eat in my house. And that frightened them. And they have a word with his servants. Uh, and the servant says, don't be worried, I've had your money. And that confuses them even more. And so they come into Joseph's house. And they bow now before him to the ground for a second time. How is your aged father, he said. Is my dad alive, but he isn't getting there yet? Oh, yes, he is. And then he looks round and he sees Ben, his own brother. Hadn't seen him for years. Is this your youngest brother? God be gracious to you, but it was enough. He couldn't cope. And so he goes out and weeps his heart out. This is not a man, I repeat, if you've missed it the first time, seeking vengeance. He's a man controlling himself. And he's bursting to put his arms around them. But he can't. Because he doesn't know if they've repented. So he serves the food. And the brothers found themselves sitting in order of their ages round the table. They found they were subject to a bit of unexpected intelligent design. <laughs> now there's a tendentious statement if ever there was one. <laughs> and I suppose, but then it would be, oh, perhaps unwise to say that of Joseph could do it. God may be able to do it too. To shake people up by the discovery that what they expected to be random is not. But that's a story for another time, of course. But it certainly shook them up. And Joseph gets his steward to fill the sacks again. And we go through the story briefly. And he puts his cup in the sack of Benjamin. And they discover this. And Joseph sends the steward behind them and after them and catches up with them at their rest station. And says, look, somebody's stolen my master's cup. And they're shocked, of course, and terrified. Well, if any of your servants is found to have it, he will die and the rest of us will become slaves. And the steward said, oh, no. 
Whoever is found to have it will become my slaves. The rest of you will be free from blame. And they found it in Benjamin's sack. So they are free to go. They're now faced with the same situation with Benjamin with which they've been faced with Joseph. Do we let him go? They had Joseph go. They sold him. But now has anything changed? What does Benjamin mean to them? Now the second big step to repentance. Let's go back to Egypt. God's working. They will not abandon Benjamin. And now Joseph watches them silently filing through the door. And now they're not just she's politely bowing as at the first occasion. They throw themselves on the ground in front of the Grand Vizier of Egypt. And they hear the dreadful voice, what have you done? Judah steps up. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. It's dawning on Judah's mind what it's all about. It's not just Joseph uncovering their guilt. It's God. And he says, we are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one. Oh no, says Joseph, I wouldn't do anything like that. Only the man that has the cup will be my slave. The rest of you go back. And now they've got another chance to get free. And Judah comes. And he says, Please, he says, Please. You said to us, Your Majesty, Do you have a father and a brother? And we said, we have an aged father, and there's a young son born to him, his brother's dead, and he's the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. And you said, bring him down, and we said, the boy cannot leave his father. And I said, that I would go guarantee for him. If the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father sees the boy isn't there. Your servants will bring his gray head down to the grave. So please, please, man, have you got any heart? Please, your majesty, let him go home. I can't bear to see what will happen to my dad if he doesn't go home? Take me! Please! And history changes. As Judah dimly perceives the love the father has for the son. Please take me. Magnificent, isn't it? And you can see the scene as eternity intersects with time. And Judah becomes an Aslan, a lion. Prostrate on the floor. He says, take me instead of him. Heaven begins to sing. Because Judah has discovered the heart and the secret of the universe. That on a large scale will be the thing around which eternity revolves. The lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. I turn. I saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain. And 
the praise starts to rise. And there's Joseph. And he says, brothers, it's me. It's Joseph. And their mouths drop open. And they look at the one they nearly pierced. Their heart stands still with the revelation to Israel that the one they'd rejected is the ruler of the world. It's me, man. It's me. It was hard to take in, wasn't it? God, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And he puts his arms around them and they weep together. I'm moved by it. You can see that. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is just a faint picture of what Jesus did for me. He said to the Father, take me instead of him. Shall we pray?